Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Julie Squires to you. Julie Squires is a certified compassion fatigue specialist and a certified life coach. Julie is the founder and principal of Rekindle LLC. Julie brings a unique perspective and approach to support the sustained energy and passion of those that work with and for animals in the emotionally challenging fields of veterinary medicine, animal welfare, lab animal research, animal advocacy, and conservation and environmentalism. Julie has over 25 years of experience within leading organizations such as Bayer, IDEX, and Nestle Purina, developing and executing training, workshops, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. She is a certified compassion fatigue specialist through the Traumatology Institute. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, I think this is a super important topic that we're talking about, especially in the animal welfare world. So I want to welcome you. I want you to relax. I want you to, again, we have um, some time here just to kind of dive into compassion fatigue and essentially how do we avoid it? And I'm putting avoid, I probably should have put it into quotes because I I think it's unrealistic to expect that we will avoid completely compassion fatigue. It's, you know, compassion fatigue is a normal part of working in animal welfare. It is, but it doesn't have to be um, so damaging that it takes us away from the work or that it interferes with our relationships, our personal relationships. So I'll get into that a little bit in a moment here. But who am I? You might be wondering. You heard a little bit about me. Uh, the only other things I think that I would add to that is that, you know, I'm really passionate about you and your mental health. And I want to help you reframe some things in your mind so that you can continue to do this work for the long term. Because let's be honest, we need you to do this work for the long term. And I need you to be mentally healthy. Otherwise, it's pointless, right? I don't want you to be doing this work, giving of yourself, wanting to improve animals' lives when you are taking away from your own life. That doesn't make any sense. If you're harming yourself in the process, you're doing it wrong. So, um, Again, I am the owner of a whole bunch of animals. I've got a couple dogs who are in the room here with me. Um, I have a tortoise who's also in the room. I have a couple cats who are not in the room by design because they would set off the dogs. But when, I, when I'm not here in my home with my own animals, I also have some other animals that I call my friends. And when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, I am a weekend humane educator at a farmed animal sanctuary near where I live called Catskill Animal Sanctuary. And um, these are just some of my friends that I miss dearly because I haven't seen them since last year because of the pandemic. But, you know, I want to just to kind of connect with you on an animal welfare level. At the sanctuary, we have over 300 animals that have been rescued from abuse, neglect, abandonment. Uh, and, you know, I get to see the transformation in them. And it's part of what I dare say lights me up. I, I love going there because it reminds me about the resiliency that we all have, right? Animals show it to us all of the time. And 99% of them are able to bounce back even from some, you know, pretty awful situations. And we know that there's a percentage that doesn't. And maybe my number is a little high as far as 99%. But we know that there's some percentage that, that aren't able to. Um, and interestingly enough, actually, in the upper right hand, upper left hand corner, there are two sheep. And the first one looking at you is Christopher. The one behind him who, whose face is kind of cut off was his mom. And that was Noelle. And she actually was one of those uh, animals that um, wasn't able to really trust humans again, but she, yet she lived an amazing life. She lived a life that she knew nothing but love. So today I want to thank, of course, Assisi for bringing me to you, making this connection. And, you know, this is an important connection. Your mental health, again, is vital. It's vital for you to continue to do the work that you want to do, but it's also vital in your life. And I want to be of some help for that. So here's where we're headed today. I want to talk with you a little bit about compassion fatigue. I have a feeling you pretty much know a lot about it. I want to talk with you about the flip side of compassion fatigue, which is compassion satisfaction. And then I want to talk with you about three ways to avoid it. So 
relax, enjoy yourself, give yourself hopefully some undivided time here. We don't have a lot of time together. So, um, you know, the, the, the more undivided it can be, the better. So for you, and that's what I want. So let's talk a little bit about your professional quality of life, if you will. So there's two sides to this equation. I'm going to start on the right-hand side. So with compassion fatigue, how would I define compassion fatigue? I get asked that all of the time. And, you know, the way that I define compassion fatigue is it's basically this cumulative effect of bearing witness to other beings' pain and suffering. So those other beings could be animals. Yes. Those other beings could also be your coworkers, volunteers, people that you're interacting with in animal welfare work. Um, so it could be all of that. And when we are repeatedly being exposed to physical and even emotional pain and suffering of others, over time that has an impact on us. Why? Because we are living, breathing human beings with hearts. And, you know, we are we can handle it to some degree, but if we don't know how to offset it, it can take an enormous toll on us. So we have to be aware of that. Now, I want to be really clear with you. Compassion fatigue is not a mental illness. It's a set of signs and symptoms. It looks different in everybody. So for some people, they might have anxiety or depression or sleep problems, or they might be drinking too much, or they might be overeating, or they might have um, physical ailments, digestive problems, or they might be isolating themselves, or they might be irritable, or they're blowing up, uh, you know, at, at people who are, you know, trying to ask them a question or something like that. We might find ourselves, you know, making mistakes more readily because our mind is sort of um, scattered. And again, you know, I work a lot with the, with the veterinary field. And in the veterinary field, we're unfortunately seeing lots of suicide. So on the slide, you also see suicide there. And yes, like that, of course, can also be um, a tragic end to when we don't recognize, number one, what's going on for us. And you can't change anything that you don't recognize. So first of all, give yourself a break. If you're noticing any of these signs or symptoms in yourself, give yourself a break that perhaps maybe up until right now, you didn't even have the opportunity to take stock in what's going on for you. Now, if you work with an organization, which I'm going to guess many of you that are on do, or you, again, some of you may be solo in the work that you do, but if you work, you know, in a shelter, if you work for a rescue, if you work for some sort of um, municipality in doing your animal welfare work, then yes, compassion fatigue can have a negative consequence on all of that, including low morale, low turn or high turnover, low teamwork or lack of teamwork the quality of care that you're providing can be negatively impacted. The customer experience, right? The, the, um, if you're in a shelter and you're wanting to adopt out animals, again, the adoptees experience working with your shelter or rescue, again, could be in, impacted if you're, again, experiencing compassion fatigue. And for sure, an increased level of cynicism, complaining, blaming, we see that a lot. And we start to, again, have this false belief that, you know, people suck and, um, and all human beings are terrible. And that's just such not a great mindset to go into this work with because we need people. People are part of the solution and we have to learn how to connect with them. So burnout is a little bit different. It contributes to compassion fatigue, but burnout really is a workplace specific issue. There's no trauma component to burnout. So you could be burned out if you work in a grocery store. You can be burned out if you work at Home Depot. Burnout literally means too much work, not enough resources. So in animal welfare, that's usually too many animals, not enough people to take care of them. Too many animals, not enough cages. Too many sick animals, not enough veterinarians to um, look after them. Too much, too little. Too many cages that need to be cleaned. Again, not enough people. Too much, too little. Too many animals in need of something, not enough funding. Again, too much, too little. Over time, we can get burned out. So you can be burned out and have compassion fatigue at the same time, which is not all that uncommon. But it's not all doom and gloom, my friends. Clearly, you know that or you wouldn't be involved in this work. There's a whole opposite side of this equation, and that's the compassion satisfaction part. So what is compassion satisfaction? Well, it's the reason you come back every day, right? Compassion satisfaction is the pleasure you derive from it. 
Compassion satisfaction is what fills you up about your work. Compassion satisfaction is what gives you a smile on your face every day, hopefully, right? But we have to really make sure that we're connecting with that. And that is part of the three ways that we can avoid compassion fatigue. So let's start there. The three ways that I think the best ways to avoid compassion fatigue are number one, looking for the good. I'll talk with you more about that in a second. Number two, taking responsibility for your feelings. I am going to teach you where your feelings come from and you're going to be surprised. <laughs> Number three is about practicing, I don't mean just self-care, I mean exceptional self-care and I don't mean just every once in a while or when you think about it. I mean every single dang day, no exceptions. All right, you can see where I'm headed. Let's start with looking for the good. What does it mean to look for the good? Well, there are three ways that you can look for the good. So let me explain this. As a human being, you have a brain that is skewed towards the negative. As a human being, without you doing anything, your brain is always looking for the problems. It's looking for what's wrong with humanity. It's looking for what's wrong with you. It's looking for what's wrong with your kids. It's looking for what's wrong with your partner. It's looking for what's wrong with your organization. It's always looking for what's wrong. Have you noticed? So you have to deliberately choose to look for the things that are good. Otherwise, you will get a very skewed and untrue sense of the world. It basically, here's an, here's an analogy I just came up with in this split second. If you, if you aren't deliberate about looking for the good, your brain will be like watching the nightly news. How you know like every story is terrible until the last story, you get like one good story with then you get like 15 terrible stories. That's your brain on default. So I wanna take your brain off of default. I wanna talk with you about three different ways to actually look for the good. Number one is to get crystal clear. Every single person who's watching this, I want you to create for yourself after this webinar, a sentence of what's your why? Why do you do this work? And it needs to be more than you love animals. That's great, but I want to stretch you a little bit more, right? Because loving animals is sort of like the easy, but I want you to dig a little bit deeper into why do you do this work? What does it mean to you? What is your intention? What are you trying to accomplish in the world? How are you trying to make the world better? It's so important to understand this and get crystal clear and have a short little phrase that you can even, um, I'm looking all over my desk for like a post-it note, that you can put on a post-it note, right? Like your little phrase, boom, and you can like post it all over the place. So you're constantly reminding yourself, of, oh yeah, this is why I do this work. This is why it's important. When you have the difficulties, you look at that phrase and you're like, oh, that's right, because I'm here to relieve suffering or whatever your thing might be. Number two, are you celebrating the wins? OMG, I can't tell you how frustrating it can be for me when I work with shelters and rescue organizations that you work so hard to place animals, to rehome them to find them homes and yet you never sit back and actually bask in the glory of it you work so hard but you cheat yourself out of the reward of why you do this work in the first place so whether that means scrolling on facebook and looking at your placements and like how these pets are now in amazing lives um, communicating to your whole organization how many adoptions or placements or fosters we had this week and how they're all doing. It's so important to constantly keep communicating that information and making sure people are taking some time to actually read it and look at it and take some pride for how hard you all work. Please don't cheat yourself out of the rewards. And the third way to look for the good is to start a gratitude practice. This if you want a shortcut to happiness, this is it. And it's simple. Here's what you do. Next time you're at Target or Staples, you get yourself a cute little notebook that has a cute little phrase on it. It doesn't have to be. You could just get a boring little notebook. But hey, why not get one that has a cute little phrase on it? Every single day, write down three things you're grateful for and don't allow any repeats. This will train your brain to start looking for what's good. Again, you have to work against your brain that is right now, hardwired to look for the negative. Your brain is, is wired for survival. It isn't wired for happiness. So if you want to be surviving and happy, again, you have to do some of these things that I'm talking about. You've got to look for the things that are going well. And 
there is an abundance out there that's going well. I trust you, even during a pandemic, which is bizarre, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, and some of the proven benefits of gratitude, like holy smokes, look at all these things. Who doesn't want any of these things? I love the third bullet point, enhances empathy and reduces aggression. Come on, my friends, who doesn't want that? We all do. Uh, improving self-esteem and building relationships. Again, gratitude is super powerful. Number two, take responsibility for your feelings. So let me teach you something here. Um, we're not supposed to be happy all of the time. That is not a human life. Nobody promised us that, but yet, well, I shouldn't say that. Cinderella, the fairy tales promised us a wonderful life, which was, you know, we were going to be happy all the time. And then we start living a life and we're like, wait a minute, I don't feel happy all the time. Clearly, there must be something wrong with me. Here I am doing this work. I love animals. I care about them. I want to do the best for them. And I don't feel great all the time. There mu clearly, there must be something wrong with me, or so we think. There is nothing wrong with you. So a human life is not, again, we're not supposed to feel positive emotions all of the time. We're not supposed to be happy and in bliss all of the time. It's 50-50. 50% of the time, we are going to feel positive emotions. Positive emotions are happiness, joy, motivated, inspired, love, bliss, excited, energized. And then 50% of the time, guess what? We're going to feel negative emotions, despair, grief sadness, anger, frustration, overwhelm, stress. And you might be wondering why. Because it's the contrast between the two. You wouldn't know what happiness was if you didn't know what sadness was. You wouldn't know what love was if you didn't know what hate was or anger, right? It's the contrast between the two. There has to be the contrast. Otherwise, the positive emotions would not even feel positive. A human life is a combination of it all. Even during a pandemic, it's 50-50. It's always 50-50. So I want to talk with you a little bit about where your feelings come from, because I have a feeling you probably have been taught erroneously like I was. I was taught that my feelings came from things outside in the world. I was taught that things that other people said and did caused my feelings. I was taught that events in the world caused my feelings. I was taught that I wasn't taught this, but that a pandemic causes my feelings, right? So if you think, again, and this is where we go wrong, we are taught that, um, you know, somebody screaming at us, you don't care about animals, um, you know, we are taught that that's what makes us mad, and it doesn't. We're taught that the amount of animals that we have in the shelter is what makes us feel defeated because, you know, all the cages are filled. That doesn't cause you to feel defeated, doesn't cause you to feel anything. Circumstances, things outside of you don't cause your feelings. Just like someone surrendering a 10-year-old dog doesn't cause your feeling of anger. Things outside of you don't cause your feelings. Circumstances don't cause feelings. What they do cause or what they do trigger is a thought in your mind, and it's the thought in your mind that causes your feelings. So walk with me through cognitive psychology for a split second here. Circumstances are things that happen. People saying things, people doing things, you know, um, people dropping off a litter of kittens in your front stoop. That's a circumstance. That doesn't cause you to feel a thing until you have a thought about it. Then you have a thought about it. Like, what's wrong with people? Everyone's, you know, um, people are so, are so irresponsible. Then you feel angry. It's that thought that causes you to feel angry. That same exact situation, you could choose to think differently about it. You could decide to think, well, hey, they brought them to the right place. They know we're going to take care of them. And then you can, again, rather than feeling angry about it, you can feel perhaps fulfilled about that. You could feel even excited about that, that, you know, again, they weren't left along the side of the road. So it is your thoughts that cause your feelings. So essentially, you cause your feelings. This is good to know because when you take responsibility for how you feel, when you stop blaming other things outside of you for how you feel, here's what you do. You take all of your power back. You no longer blame others for how you feel. You no longer blame situations that you can't control for how you feel because that's what we do. We, we try to control things we can't control because we think we're going to feel better. But we don't, the way to feel better is to change the way you're thinking. Why is this important? Your thoughts essentially create your life. Your thoughts about people, yourself, 
pet overpopulation, your board members, the management, your colleagues, your thoughts about politics, about your significant other, your family, all of those thoughts are what are creating your life. Your thoughts create your feelings, your actions, and your results, essentially your life. It's important to pay attention to what it is you're thinking. And here's where we go wrong. We start believing everything we think. We start believing that all people are terrible. We start believing that people shouldn't have pets if they can't afford them. We start believing that people are irresponsible. And again, those, any of those thoughts, first of all, are not true. They're not facts. Your thoughts aren't facts. Your thoughts are just your observations. Your thoughts are your perspective. And again, your thoughts are not facts. But you want to pay attention to them because, again, they're creating your reality. And if you don't like your reality, then you want to think about, hey, what am I thinking? Like, am I, am I directing my brain or is it just sort of over there in negativity land? Which, again, hopefully I'm shining a light on, yeah, if you're not actively choosing what to think, if you're not stepping back from a situation and recognizing, hmm, wait a minute, my thoughts are a choice, my thoughts are optional, so am I actually choosing my thoughts here? How else can I see this situation of a basket of kittens being dropped out on this, being dropped off on the stoop, right? One way to think about it is how irresponsible people are. Another way to think about it is, like I said, I'm so glad they brought them here. They brought them to the right place. They knew what they were doing, right? We so easily want to, you know, kind of go down the rabbit hole of the negativity. But again, who suffers? Look in the mirror. That will be the person that suffers. We suffer. We suffer based on what we're thinking. The person who dropped off the kittens cannot feel your anger. The person who dropped off the kittens cannot feel your rage. You're the only one feeling your anger and your rage. So if you want to change the way you feel, when you don't want to feel anger or rage or um, judgmental, again, we can get very judgmental in the animal, in the animal world. We, get very, very, very judgmental. If you don't want to feel any of that stuff, if you recognize that feeling those emotions doesn't serve you, if you recognize that feeling those emotions doesn't make you show up in animal welfare the way you want, the version of yourself that you want, if you recognize that feeling those emotions is depleting and is, again, contributing to compassion fatigue because you're, again, you're creating for yourself such an emotional tsunami, if you will, by what you're choosing to think. And I know most of you don't recognize that you're choosing to think it. So welcome. I've now hopefully shown a light on the fact that, yes, you're choosing it. So if you don't like how that feels, choose something different. And yes, this is a skill to develop. My, one of my favorite quotes of all quotes from the, the, the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at actually change. It's brilliant. And it's the truth. This is truth. So as I'm talking about emotional responsibility, the question becomes, how do you feel? How do you want to feel? And you're responsible for both of those answers. So at first, you might be a little mad at me. You're like, wait a minute. I thought I liked her, but now I don't. No, but then I want you to actually feel empowered to understand, oh, this actually kind of frees me up. Like stuff happens in the world. People do and say things. And I always get to decide how to think and feel about it. That's on me. And are there times that I do want to be angry about things? For sure. But please recognize still that you're choosing anger. And yes, there are things that I want to choose anger about, right? Of course. But I'm recognizing that I'm choosing to be angry about it because of what I'm thinking. And I own that. I don't put it off on somebody else and think somebody else is making me angry. That's the difference. And one of the things that I think is really important, especially I talked a little bit about being judgmental, right? And one of the things I've learned in working with animals myself and in working with people who work with animals is that 
we think we know what's going on with other people. We get like a snapshot into their life. They show up at the shelter. They have a geriatric dog that they're surrendering. We think we've got them all figured out, right? We think we know and we're judging them and they're terrible people. And don't you know, we're probably not going to be able to adopt the dog. And, you know, what kind of a person does this? And, you know, where are you moving to the moon where you can't bring your dog? All of that stuff. But I tell you, like, we don't know the whole story. And if you can give people the benefit of the doubt, if you can assume that in that moment, in the moment that you are dealing with somebody, no matter how they're behaving, and I'm not talking about being abusive, okay? Let's, let's, we're all, we're going to agree that people being abusive need to, to be escorted away from you. And yes, I'm, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm just talking about people raising their voice. I'm talking about people yelling. Um, that, and again, where you're determining that that's not abusive. And again, you have to figure that out for yourself. But, you know, it's just someone raising their voice isn't being abusive. Depending upon the words coming out of their mouth, we might want to interpret that as abusive. But when you can just assume that people in that moment are doing the best they can with what they have, it frees you up. It, it, it all of a sudden makes whatever is happening, that interaction not be personal. And I'm telling you, 95% of the time, you don't have a clue of what the whole story is. You think you do. I know it. I used to think I did too, but we don't. We don't. So when we can assume, again, that people are doing the best they can, it will, it will be such a gift to give yourself. All right. Number three. Here comes a self-care piece. I want to impress upon you that you don't need to make a choice between taking care of animals and taking care of yourself or your family members. It needs to be all of it. There's no choice to be made. You have to embrace all of it. But I want to talk about you taking care of you because this is a non-negotiable, my friends. And please, please, please understand that when we're talking about well-being, like it's this whole package it's the mind, it's the body, it's the spirit. You can't, you can't neglect yourself in order to help others that are neglected. It makes no sense. You have to understand with all of your being that you have to be at the top of your priority list. You have to fill yourself first before you can ever or before you should ever, ever expect of yourself to help somebody else. It can't come as an afterthought. You have to be the number one. And self-care looks different for everybody. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. It can take 10 minutes. What are you doing for yourself today that takes 10 minutes? Maybe it's that you took the time to pack a lunch. Maybe it's that you took 10 minutes to journal. Maybe it's you took 10 minutes to walk around the shelter. Maybe it's you took 10 minutes to meditate. Maybe it's you took a 10-minute walk with your 900 dogs. <laughs> and I met your personal 900 dogs. I know how you guys are. Um, maybe it's 10 minutes of sipping your coffee in the morning on your front porch and watching the birds. Maybe it's 10 minutes where all you are is just being with yourself. You're not on your phone. Your phone doesn't count for self-care. And whatever that might be, I want to impress upon you that you cannot give from an empty well. When you try to, you end up then feeling angry and resentful. If you're feeling angry, resentful, and depleted, that's just a signal to you that you need to, again, focus on yourself. Here's what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with animal welfare is not about sacrificing yourself to help others. It makes no sense like I said earlier, it makes no sense to harm yourself to help others. If you're harming yourself to help others, you're not making the world better because you're taking yourself out of the world. And we need you in the world. We need you in the world whole. We need you in the world from a place of wellness and well-being. I want you to fill yourself up so much that you are able to give to animals and to people from what comes of the overflow from your abundance, not from your depletion. So as you can tell, I'm super passionate about this because you, you, you need me to be passionate about it because you discredit this and you discount it and you don't think that you're important enough. And I'm here to tell you that the work is amazing, but it can't fulfill you in the ways that you want to be fulfilled because you've got to do that for yourself. The work can fulfill you to some degree, but not to the entirety of how you want to feel. That needs to come from you. Self-care equals self-love. And again, you know how to love. 
I know you know how to love. You love on these animals like no one's business. That's why you're really good at what you do. Take some of that love and point it toward yourself. So Greg and Dwayne, my rescued cats, they are brothers and they are pain in the butt, which is why, oh my gosh, here's what's funny. Um, before I go to my last slide, you'll notice in the picture, if you notice the cabinet up on the upper left, you'll see there's a child lock there. I have no children. It's because these cats bust into all my cabinets. <laughs> so um, here's all my contact info. If you're into podcasts, check it out. If you want to jump on my weekly eat inspiration newsletter, jump on that. And um, it's been super great. I'm going to turn us back over to the amazing Assisi folks. And